So the first time I ask all speakers to stay in time because it's a current session so that people have the chance to change between the two lecture halls. I will show them some five minutes, one minute, and stop. Yeah, then we have maybe one or two minutes for questions. <coughs> the first speaker is David Andrew from, from Munich, and the title of his talk is Non-Geometric Fluxes in Higher Dimensions 1. Thanks a lot. So let me first thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present this work. Uh, this work has been done in Munich with my collaborators and has been presented in, in these papers and some work in progress. It's also in relation to many recent papers uh, that I don't have time to talk about, unfortunately, but um, yeah, I'm really happy that there's such a, an activity recently on this topic. Um, all right, so what is the topic? The topic is non-geometry. Uh, more precisely here, non-geometry in four-dimensional and ten-dimensional supergravity. Uh, to be precise, I'm actually going to restrict myself to the NSNS sector, uh, the bosonic fields being obviously the metric, the B-field, and the dilaton. So what is non-geometry? Um, well, it's a long story. I don't have much time. Uh, let me give a brief overview. Um, so let me first say that it's described very differently in 4D and 10D. So in 4D, um, non-geometry appears via some uh, specific terms which occur in the potential of supergravity. Um, these terms are generated by some uh, specific integers, uh, Q and R, which have a very specific set of indices here. They're called the non-geometric fluxes. Um, they can be uh, related to some specific gaugings in four-dimensional gauge supergravity. Um, these terms are actually good for phenomenology, and that's the reason for me to, to talk of this topic in this conference. Um, they can be used or have been used to stabilize moduli um, for Minkowski solutions or also to find the Sitter solutions. So I think that's the motivation for the topic. Uh, we'd like to, to understand all this topic better to, to be able to, to use these nice properties, basically. Um, so that's for 4D. For 10D, the story is different. Actually, non-geometry originally came in 10D in these papers in 2002. Um, I don't have much time to talk about it. Dieter already talked about it yesterday. Um, let me say two things. First, the relation to 4D is pretty unclear. And secondly, um, as Dieter said, if you take a 10-dimensional configuration of fields, which is non-geometric, um, typically they actually look ill-defined, meaning they're not single-valued and there are some global issues. So that's all we need to know here in this talk uh, about 10D non-geometry, but there are global issues, basically. All right, so given this uh, setup, 4D, 10D, there are natural questions to be asked. Um, first question is, since these four-dimensional non-geometric terms are, are interesting for phenomenology, can we obtain them from a compactification, say? Um, the answer is no, um, or no until recently, maybe. Um, and the reason is that these terms have a very specific shape, a very specific dependence on, on scalars, and this dependence cannot be reproduced by, by standard uh, supergravity um, ingredients. Another uh, way to phrase the question is, what, what is this Q and this R? Is there a ten-dimensional uh, meaning or origin for these two objects? Uh, as I've said, this Q and this R have a very specific set of indices, and naively, you don't find any fields uh, in 10 dimension which has this type of indices. So it's not clear what, what they could come from in 10 dimensions. OK. Um, one could maybe think that uh, relating this to 10 dimensional non geometry would help. For instance, obtain that from a compactification. But um, this is also difficult. As I said, the 10 dimensional non geometry configuration of fields eh, is usually globally ill-defined. So you cannot integrate over it. You cannot perform the standard uh, compactification procedure because you don't know how to treat the global aspects. Um, OK, so yeah, this is the situation. And in this talk, I want to, to present you some progress uh, in, in relating the 4D and 10D point of view and also answering these questions, basically. Um, okay, so the, the answer we found uh, comes from a field redefinition. 
So the idea is that uh, you take your NSNS fields and you uh, redefine fields, so you rewrite things a bit. If you do that, the Q and the R will appear in the 10 dimensional Lagrangian. So this means that this answers this question that the Q and the R fluxes are not exotic objects. We don't know where they come from. They are actually present already from the start in the NSNS Lagrangian. And it's just a matter of rewriting things to, to see them appear, basically. Um, so this gives an answer to this question. And we actually got answers to the other questions, because, uh, or at least in some examples, um, the new fields you get after redefining them turn out to be globally defined. So you don't have any global issues anymore once you look at the new fields. Therefore, you can <coughs> perform the compactification and if you do that, you obtain the good scalar potential, meaning you obtain the good uh, non-geometric terms in the potential. Um, so this also provides uh, an origin to this uh, term. All right, so the plan of my talk is to detail all this. First, the field redefinition, and secondly, the dimensional reduction. OK, so um, the field redefinition goes as follows. The key object is beta. Beta is an anti-symmetric bivector. So in particular, it has two indices up. Um, so the reason for considering this comes from uh, some literature uh, using Jarais uh, complex geometry applied to supergravity. Um, in these papers, there were some arguments saying that whenever you have some non-geometry, non um, beta could be uh, make appear, basically, or could appear. And it would be good to characterize the non-geometry. So there, there should be some relation between these two things. There were also some formulas proposed to, to relate the beta to the non-geometric fluxes. So I don't have time to, to review these arguments, um, but we were inspired by these ideas, basically. And so the idea is, OK, let's make beta appear, and this should be good for non-geometry. So how do you make beta appear? Well, we understood that uh, beta can, can appear if you reparameterize the Jarais metric. So you probably know this matrix, the Jarais metric, which depends on, on the metric and the B fields. You can actually reparameterize it this way in terms of a new metric, G tilde, and this beta here. Um, if you do that, uh, well, you get some equality, so you get some relations between GB and G tilde and beta. These relations can actually be repackaged that way, um, which is very convenient. And, and Peter, in the next talk, will, will be using this relation. So um, in addition to these equalities, we also wanted a new dilaton. So we actually introduced a phi tilde uh, that we defined that way in order to, to preserve the measure. So the bottom line is that uh, we have a field redefinition between the NSNS fields and these new fields, the new metric, the beta, and the new dilaton. And according to, to this literature, beta should be favored for non-geometry. Um, all right, so let's do the naive thing. Now I just take the NSNS Lagrangian, and I just apply this field redefinition, and let's see what happens. Since beta could be related to the non-geometric fluxes, it could be that they appear in the Lagrangian. And actually, this is what happens. Yes? Sorry. What you, call t uh, what you call field redefinition also includes t derivative transformation. No, it's uh, for me personally, it's a different uh, thing. It's not a t duality. Um, so I take this NSNS Lagrangian and I, I do the brute force replacement and redefine my fields there. Uh, the computation is quite involved. Uh, so in the first paper, we, we made some assumption to simplify the computations. Even if you do that, the computation is still a bit involved. So the Ricci scalar can be expressed in terms of a new Ricci scalar plus all these terms here. However, if you also do the replacement for the dilaton and the H flux, it turns out that there are impressive constellations and uh, all these terms simply drop out. <coughs> and you are left with a simple expression, which is this. So you get indeed the new Ricci, the new dilaton, and some Q squared. Um, so we call that L tilde and a uh, total derivative here. So the Q is here given by the derivative of beta, and the square is the standard square with contractions. Now in the next papers, we actually uh, dropped the assumption, and so we got more terms here, which go together with the Q. 
and also an R squared here. So this we actually called R flux, and the square is also the standard square. Um, again, there are two ways of doing the computation. Uh, the brute force methods, which actually can be worked out. It's a bit lengthy, but it's doable. Uh, another method is to use double field theory, which uh, eases a lot for computation, and Peter is going to talk about this. Okay, so um, the bottom line here is that if I do this theory definition, I get some objects Q and R which appear in SendD. Um, are these really the same things as the four-dimensional <coughs> Q and R that I talked about? So I'm going to do a dimensional reduction and obtain the non-geometric terms uh, in 4D to show you that it's indeed the same. Okay, so I go quicker <coughs> here. So I, I'm going to do a, a rather simple dimensional reduction where I only consider uh, two scalars, the volume and the dilaton. I start from 10D theory and I, I get a 4D theory basically with a potential depending on this row and dilaton. So I, I don't detail this, it's, it's rather standard. So for instance, if I take the NS and S Lagrangian, I obtain two terms in my potential. The first term is due to the H flux, the H square. The second term is due to the curvature, so the Ricci scan. Um, what about non-geometric terms? So non-geometric terms are actually argued to uh, enter the potential in that manner. Uh, so you add two new terms, one due to the Q flux and one due to the R flux. As I said previously, you cannot um, mix this term with the others because they definitely have a different dependence on the moduli. So you cannot obtain them with the standard tools of uh, supergravity. The result we get is that if you take the L tilde, so the new Lagrangian, instead of the NSNS, -NS, you, you do get the good potential in the sense that you, you reproduce the, these terms here. So more precisely, here's what we get. We get a new term for the, with the Ricci, so the curvature, uh, a term for the R flux, uh, given by what we call the R flux, and a term for the Q flux, uh, also given by this Q square and, and other terms here. So the bottom line is that if I take this L tilde um, uh, and, and these 10 dimensional objects I call Q and R, they do give the good potential. They do give an origin to, this, to these two terms that I was not able to, to get before, basically. Now, I agree with you that this expression is a bit complicated. So the precise matching to the, to the four dimensional Q object uh, might might need to be improved, for instance, if we could get a square here instead of this whole thing, that would be better. Um, but in any case, I, I obtained the, the good term in the scalar potential. The double field theory uh, will bring uh, a nice interpretation for this term, so I, I refer you to the next talk as well <coughs> about it. Excuse me? Yeah. Is this always on the same duality orbit as a geometric compactification? Um, no, it, it, it depends. It doesn't have to be. So, um, yeah, this leads me to this last slide, actually. I haven't talked about uh, global aspects yet. So I've just done the dimensional reduction, assuming things were globally defined. But it actually depends whether things are globally defined or not. So I've told you that I can always rewrite for Lagrangian and SNS Lagrangian like that. However, if I start with uh, a non-geometric configuration in 10D, <laughs> This Lagrangian, by definition, will be ill-defined. I, I cannot integrate it because there are global issues. So I cannot perform by my dimensional reduction on it. I cannot get the, the terms. However, it happens that for some examples, uh, where, when this is ill-defined, this uh, is actually uh, well-defined. So how can this be true? Well, it means that all the problems I had here can actually go only into the total derivative. So in that case, what we propose is actually to forget about the total derivative and just consider this L tilde. And this is then the good uh, low energy description for string theory on the non-geometric background. That's what we prescribe. Um, if you do that, of course, as I said, you, you can take this L tilde, integrate it, and you get the good non-geometric uh, terms in the potential. Um, all right. So this establishes basically a relation between 4D and 10D non-geometry. Because if I start from a 10-dimensional non-geometric configuration, I can go through all these steps, and I get in the end non-geometric terms in the potential. So now there's a relation between the two. All right, since I'm uh, out of time, let me just flash the conclusions and outlook. 
Um, what I want to stress is that uh, here we've done an SNS. We'd like to extend that to Ramon Ramon or other sectors of supergravity. And after that, uh, I hope that this would give us access to new uh, backgrounds, new interesting backgrounds to be used for phenomenology. <laughs> Thanks. Um, but can you also do this with the H flux in the background so that you have all the possible terms in the scalar potential? Uh, not yet, uh, because the theory definition we have uh, uh, totally um, gets rid of the B field, you get a beta instead. So uh, if you want to have the H flux at the same time, you would need both a B and a beta, which is actually too many degrees of freedom. Uh, so either you have B and beta along different directions and then H and the non-geometric flux is along di different directions, for instance, or you could imagine something more involved with some constraint to be added or something like that. But then this means you're probably on the same duality orbit as a geometric compactification, no? Um, not always, um, because, um, because of this, uh, well, because this theory definition is not a T-duality for me. So to me it is decoupled. Um, so it could be that I have a a globally well-defined uh, solution with G and beta, which cannot be related by T duality to anything. But still, it would be an interesting solution. Okay, so last question. It's related to the same thing, but then you're changing physics by applying field redefinition? Yeah, in, 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 so in particular in the case when it's not T dual to any nice geometric solution, yes, you get new physics, exactly. Okay. Very last question. Um, so you say that given beta, you can you can uh, get some non-trivial Q and R fluxes. Uh, do you think you can generate arbitrary Q and R fluxes that satisfy the Bianchi by some beta, or is there some further constraint on the on these fluxes? Um, so, so, so the Bianchi are not automatic given the formulas for Q and R. Yeah, I think it brings in additional constraints. Uh, yeah. But even if you satisfy those ones, do you think because beta, oh, sorry, Q and R, of course, are generated by the same field by beta. Yes. So that must yield yet additional constraints, I would think, that are not coming from the Bianchi, I would think, maybe. But. Um, why? Why would there be additional constraints? Well, because you don't have enough uh, degrees of freedom, I suppose, to generate more general Q&Rs. Uh, okay. It's contrasted to, uh, to, the, to the gauge and geometric yeah, fluxes, yeah. where you've got two fields, both the, the, the two form and the metric generating gauge and geometric fluxes. Here's yeah. just a single field. When you look at the formulas for Q and R, they're actually uh, independent uh, quantities. Uh, because... Um, you still have G tilde, so to say, it's a dual. Mm -hmm. But that's not appearing in, in these definitions yeah. over there, right? No, I, I think indeed G tilde no, should be... But there also the term, the potential, which is called R tilde, which is just there. <coughs> So for instance, here you've got the beta, which is contracted on the derivative, which is a very specific contraction, um, which can actually take that to zero. So I think these two quantities are actually independent. Um, but yeah. Okay, so. okay we thank. Thank you.